Toxic Parents continued. So we're talking about Les. Uh, as a child, Les was often weighed down with responsibilities that rightfully belonged to his parents. Because he was forced to grow up too fast and too soon, Les was robbed of his childhood. While his friends were out playing ball, Les was home performing his parents' duties. To keep the family together, Les had to become a miniature adult. He had little opportunity to be playful or carefree. Since his own needs were virtually ignored, he learned to cope with loneliness and emotional deprivation by denying that he even had needs. He was there to take care of others. He didn't matter. What makes this doubly sad is that in addition to having been the primary caretaker of his brothers, Les also became a parent to his mother. When Dad was in town, he would leave for work at 7, and lots of times he wouldn't get home until nearly midnight. On his way out the door, he would always tell me, Don't forget to do all your homework and make sure to take care of your mother. Make sure she has enough to eat. Keep the other kids quiet and see if you could do something to get a smile out of her. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make my mother happy. I was so sure there'd be something that I could do and everything would be okay again. She'd be okay again. But no matter what I did, nothing changed, and it still hasn't. And I feel really rotten about that. In addition to his housekeeping and child-rearing responsibilities, which would have been overwhelming for any child, Les was expected to be his mother's emotional caretaker. This turned out to be a recipe for failure. Children who are caught in these confusing role reversals are constantly falling short. It's impossible for them to function as adults because they're not adults. What they don't understand, why they fail, they just feel deficient and guilty because of it. But they don't understand why they fail. They just feel deficient and guilty because of it. In Les's case, his driving need to work many hours beyond what was necessary served a dual purpose. It kept him from confronting the loneliness and deprivation of both his childhood and his adult life, and it reinforced his long health belief that he could never do enough. Les's fantasy was that if he could put in enough hours, he could prove that he really was a worthwhile, adequate person that he really could get the job done right. In essence, he was still trying to make his mother happy. So when does it ever stop? Les didn't see his parents continue to wield their toxic power over him in his adult life. A few weeks later, however, the connection between his adult struggles and his childhood moved sharply into focus. Boy, whoever said the more things change, the more they stay the same, really knew what he was talking about. I've been in L.A. for six years now, but as far as my folks are concerned, I'm not supposed to have a life. They call me a couple times a week. It's gotten to the point where I'm afraid to answer the phone. First, my father starts in with, Your mom's so depressed. Couldn't you just take a little time off and come visit? You know how much it would mean to her. Then she gets on and tells me I'm her whole life, and she doesn't know how much longer she'll be around. What do you say to that? Half the time, I just jump on a plane. It beats dealing with the guilt of not going, but it's never enough. Nothing is. I might as well save the plane fare. Maybe I never stood. Maybe I should have never moved away. I told Les that it was typical for children who were forced to exchange emotional roles with their, with their parents to carry into their adult lives tremendous guilt and overdeveloped sense of responsibility. As adults, they often become trapped in a vicious cycle of accepting responsibility for everything, in inevitably falling short, feeling guilty and inadequate, and then redoubling their efforts. This is a draining, depleting cycle that leads to an ever-increasing sense of failure. Um, I had uh, my cousin Mike actually talked about he didn't have a childhood, so this this would really apply with with him. So driven as a little boy by the expectation of his parents, Les learned early that his goodness was judged primarily by how much he did for the rest of the family. As an adult, his parents' external demands were transformed into internal de demons that continued to drive him in the one area where he could feel some sense of work. Work. Les had neither the time nor the appropriate role model from which to learn about the giving and receiving of love. He grew up without nourishment of his emotional life, so he simply turned off his emotions. Unfortunately, he found that he couldn't turn them back on again, even when he wanted to. I assured Les that I understood how frustrated and bewildered he felt about his inability to open up to anyone emotionally, but I urged him to go easy on himself. He hadn't had anyone to teach him those things when he was young, and they're pretty tough to pick up on your own. It would be like expecting yourself to play a piano concerto when you didn't even know that where the middle C was. I told him you can learn, but you got to give yourself time to pick up the basics, to practice, and maybe even fail once or twice. If I don't take care of their, new, their needs, who will? Dear Abby, I'm in a crazy family. Can you get me out of here? Signed, Hopeless. 
This was written by one of my clients, Melanie, when she was 13. Now a 42-year-old divorced tax attendant, Melanie came to see me because of severe depression. Although she was extremely thin, she would have been quite pretty if the recent months of erratic sleep hadn't taken her toll. She was open and talked easily about herself. I feel utterly hopeless all the time, like my life is out of control. I just can't get on top of things. I feel like I'm digging myself deeper and deeper into a hole every day. I asked her to be more specific. She bit her lip, then turned away from me as she replied, There's such an emptiness inside me. I don't think I've ever felt connected to anybody in my whole life. I've been married twice and I've lived with several guys, but I just can't find the right one. I always pick either lazy bums or total bastards. Then, of course, it's up to me to set them straight. I always think I can fix them. I lend them money. I move them into my house. I even found jobs for a couple of them, and it never works, but I never learn. They don't love me no matter how much I do for them. One of these guys hit me in front of my kids. Another took off in my car. My first husband played around. My second husband was a total lush. Some track record. Without realizing it, Melanie was describing the classic behavior of a codependent personality. Originally, the term codependent was used specifically to describe the partner of an alcoholic or a drug addict. Codependent was used interchangeably with the term enabler, someone whose life was out of control because he or she was taking responsibility for saving a chemically dependent person. But in the past few years, the definition of codependency has expanded to include all people who victimize themselves in the process of rescuing and being responsible for any compulsive, addicted, abusive, or excessively dependent person. Melanie was attracted to very troubled men. She believed that if she could just be good enough, give enough, love enough, worry enough, help enough, cover up enough, and get them to see the error of their ways, they would help her. But they didn't. The kind of needy, self-centered men whom she picked were incapable of love. So instead of finding the love she so desperately sought, she found emptiness. She felt used. I discovered that the term codependent was not new to Melanie. She had first come across it when she attended a meeting of Al-Anon, a 12-step program for family members of alcoholics. During her marriage to her alcoholic husband, she was certain that she wasn't a codependent, but just had bad luck with men. She certainly had done everything she could to get Jim to stop drinking. She finally left him when she learned he had spent a night with a woman that he had met in, in a, at a bar. Melanie once again had begun looking for Mr. Wright. She blamed her problems on the men she'd been with, but she saw each one as a separate Mr. Wrong. She didn't see that the overall pattern stemmed from the way she chose her men. She thought she was looking for a man who could appreciate a giving, caring, loving, helpful woman. Surely there was a man out there that who would love a woman like that. She thought codependency was noble. Melanie had no idea that what she was called giving and helping was wiping her out. She was giving to everyone except herself. She had no idea that she had actually perpetuated the irresponsible behavior of the men in her life by sweeping up behind them. When she talked about her childhood, <coughs> it became clear that her pattern of trying to save troubled men was a compulsive repetition of her relationship with her father. I had a really weird family. My father was a successful architect, so, but he used his damned moods to control everybody. He'd come unglued by the slightest thing, like if somebody parked in his parking space. Or if I had a fight with my brother, he would just go into his room, shut the door, throw himself on the bed and cry, just like a baby. Then my mother would fall apart and go suck in the, soak in the bathtub. And I was the one who had to go in and deal with my dad. I'd just sit there with him sobbing, trying to figure out what I could do to make him feel better. But it didn't matter what I did. It was always just a matter of waiting it out. I handed to Melanie a checklist. I had made up and asked her to tell me which points described her feelings and behavior. It was a list of the major characteristics of codependency. I found it very useful over the years in helping clients determine whether they are codependent. If you think this term may apply to you, please go through the list. Codependency checklist. There's 12 items here, I think. I think a lot of people... I don't know. I mean, well, I don't know. She, she does sound like a good woman and maybe if she just didn't have uh, instead of chasing troubled men if she had a good man because I feel like good relationships you're kind of dependent on each other uh, but you're also independent too at the same time so like you're one but you're also yourself so you can't get lost in the other person uh, that's true but anyways um, 
Ashley Judd said that she was a uh, had codependency problems. So here's a list of 12 things about what makes you a codependent. Him as a universal pronoun uh, to refer to any troubled person of, of any gender. So number one, you solve his problems or you relieve his pain. Uh, believing it's the most important thing in your life, no matter what the emotional cost is to me. Number two, my good feelings depend on approval from him. Number three, I protect him from the consequences of his behavior. I lie for him, cover up for him, and never let others say anything bad about him. Number four, I try very hard to get him to do things my way. I don't pay attention to how I feel or what I want. I only care about how he feels and what he wants. Number six, I will only do, I will do anything to avoid getting rejected by him. Number seven, I will do anything to avoid making him angry at me. Number eight, I experience much more passion in a relationship that is stormy and full of drama. Number nine, I'm a perfectionist, and I blame myself for everything that goes wrong. Number ten, I feel angry, unappreciated, and used a great deal of the time. Number eleven, I pretend that everything is fine when it isn't. Number twelve, the struggle to get him to love me dominates my life. Melanie answered yes to every statement. She was astounded to see how truly codependent she was. To help her begin to break out of these patterns, I told her it was essential that she make the connection between her codependency and her relationship with her father. I asked her to remember how she had felt when he cried. At first, it really scared me because I thought daddy was dying, and then who would be my daddy? But I started to feel ashamed to see him that way, but mostly I felt this terrible guilt, like it was my fault because I had picked a fight with my brother or whatever, like I really let him down. The worst of it was that I felt so helpless because I couldn't make him happy. What's amazing is he's been dead for four years, and I'm 42 years old. I've got two kids of my own, and I still feel guilty. So, again, Melanie's 42 years old. You had uh, Les, who is, uh, you know, in, in uh, up in years. So a lot of, lot of 30 and 40-year-old people still having issues uh, from the trauma that was put on them during their formidable years during their childhood. So I asked her to remember how she had felt when he cried. So she's saying that I felt this guilt. Um, you know, like I really let him down. The worst of it was that I felt so helpless because I couldn't make him happy. Oh, yeah. And I'm 42 years old and I got two kids of my own. And I still feel guilty. Melanie was forced to be her father's caretaker. Both her parents placed her adult responsibilities squarely on young, her young shoulders. At a time in her life when she needed a strong father to give her confidence, she found herself having to pamper an infantile father instead. Melanie's first and most profound emotional relationship with the man was with her father. As a child, she was overwhelmed by both her father's neediness and the guilt she felt when she couldn't satisfy his demands. She never stopped trying to make up for her inability to make him happy, even when he wasn't around. She just found substitute needy, troubled men to take care of. Her choice of men was dictated by her need to assange the guilt uh, and by choosing the father's substitutes that she did, she perpetuated the emotional deprivation she had experienced as a child. I asked Melanie whether her mother had provided any of the love or attention that she never got from her father. My mother, my mother tried, but she was sick a lot of the times. She was always running to doctors and had to stay in bed when her colitis acted up. I, they prescribed tranquilizers and she'd eat them like popcorn. I guess she got pretty hooked. I don't know. She was always out of it. Our housekeeper really raised us. I mean, my mother was there, but she wasn't there. When I was about 13, I wrote that letter to Dear Abby. The damnedest thing was that my mother actually found it. You'd think she would have come to me and asked what I was so upset about, but I guess what I felt didn't matter to her. It was almost like I didn't exist. The Invisible Child Parents who focus their energies on their own physical and emotional survival send a very powerful message to their children. Your feelings are not important. I'm the only one who counts. Many of these children, deprived of adequate time, attention, and care, begin to feel invisible, as if they don't even exist. In order for children to develop a sense of self-worth, self -worth, a sense that they do more than occupy space, that they matter and are important, they need their parents to validate their needs and feelings. But Melanie's father's emotional needs were so overwhelming that she never noticed Melanie's needs. She was there when he cried, but he did not reciprocate. Melanie knew that her mother had found her letter to dear Abby, yet her mother never even mentioned it to her. The message from both parents was loud and clear. She was a non-entity to them. Melanie learned to define herself in terms of their feelings instead of her own. If she made them feel good, she was good. If she made, if she made them feel bad, she was bad. So... Toxic parents, number four.